Hello, my name is Evan Johnson, and I am presenting the work that me and my co-authors have done on developing a targeted approach to firmware rehosting. Many of the standard tools researchers use to improve the security and reliability of software systems do not work out of the box when applied to embedded systems. Platforms like Linux and Windows have standard, well-documented interfaces for interacting with hardware. This means that tools just work. All you have to do is obtain the code you want to test, run it within an emulator like Kimu, and you can immediately apply techniques like fuzzing and dynamic reverse engineering. But the same is not true for embedded systems. When attempting to test embedded systems, obtaining the firmware and running it inside an emulator is the easy part. The problems come when that firmware attempts to perform I.O. to hardware that may or may not really be present. This is because, unlike platforms like Linux and Windows, embedded systems often have non-standard or unique interfaces to their hardware. This makes testing in an emulation environment more difficult, as it is unlikely that the environment supports these non-standard interfaces. When we have the firmware running in an emulator without the hardware, the code will not run properly. This is because the firmware is going to expect to interact with the peripherals, for example, by reading from the peripherals device registers. But the emulator will not understand how to respond in these interactions. This will cause the firmware's execution to grind to a halt as it waits for expected behavior, inhibiting any attempt to further analyze the firmware. One solution to this problem is to handwrite device emulators for each hardware device that the firmware interacts with. The primary downside of this approach is that creating hardware models for each system you want to test is time consuming. We would like to automate this process. This is the goal of a new technique called firmware rehosting. The key idea of firmware rehosting is to automatically model the peripherals so that with only the firmware and perhaps a bit of auxiliary information, you can successfully emulate the system. So when the firmware attempts to perform IO, the emulator responds correctly even when no handwritten hardware model is present. And we can once again test the firmware. The challenge is then how to generate these synthetic devices. Our key insight is that the firmware implicitly encodes the expected hardware behavior of the system. When the firmware reads data from a device, uh, it will perform checks on the values it receives. If it receives erroneous data, it could trigger a system reset, it can hang in an infinite loop, or it may have to read again from the device. The expected hardware behavior is then encoded in what behavior is needed to make progress within the firmware. Specifically, progress towards some particular point within the firmware that denotes that the firmware has sufficiently booted. And we often only care about booting to a particular point within the firmware. For example, perhaps we want to fuzz the firmware's file system. We probably don't need to perfectly emulate every device to do this. We only need to make sure that they initialize enough so that we can boot past the file system initialization. The challenge then becomes how to find a hardware trace that reaches our point of interest. To this end, we built Jetset, a tool for targeted firmware rehosting. Jetset takes as input a firmware binary, the memory map for this binary, and its entry point. In the device inference stage, it uses directed symbolic execution to reach the analyst's point of interest within the firmware. Then, in the device synthesis stage, it takes the constraints inferred during the inference stage and uses it to construct a concrete device model. Finally, this model can be used in an unmodified emulator like Kimu to emulate the firmware for testing. First, I'll explain how Jetset infers the device constraints needed to reach the point of interest within the firmware. In the device inference stage, Jetset uses, guided, uses a guided depth-first search symbolic execution strategy to find a path to the boot point within the firmware. Guided depth-first search does not explore all possible device initialization paths, but this is fine because Jetset's goal is not to construct a complete emulator. We just want to get to the boot point as fast as possible. This search is guided by a context-sensitive distance function based on graph distance within the firmware's control flow graph. Since the distance metric is context-sensitive, this means that besides computing the graph distance within a single function, Jetset can reason about the distance that it would take to traverse function calls as well. You can find more discussion about how Jetset calculates this distance function in our paper. The distance function helps Jetset find the shortest path to the boot point but the shortest path is not always the correct one. 
When JetSet reaches a failure to boot, for example, if it causes a system reboot or hangs inside of an infinite loop, it backtracks to the last point that is closest to the boot point. I don't have time to explain each of these techniques in detail, but I can provide an example that should give you an intuition as to how JetSet works in practice. Here is a small piece of firmware whose initialization process consists of initializing a USB device and a UART device. A sensible boot point to target with JetSet would be the call to the print boot message function on the final line. Let me start by walking you through the initialization process. First, the firmware is going to check that the USB device is present by reading from one of its device registers, and, if it is, it calls the init USB function. Then, it's going to repeat the process for the UART. Finally, it will check the all OK variable in RAM to make sure the boot succeeded, and, if it did, it will call print boot message, otherwise it will jump to the failure case. JetSet starts at the entry point. First, it reads the USB present variable from the device. This variable is made symbolic because it originates in the peripherals. The next instruction compares this value to zero. Then it's time to branch on the USB present variable. JetSet checks the distances between the two branch targets and the call to print boot message, which are 11 and 16 respectively. The call in at USB path is longer since JetSet would have to call into the USB device initialization function in this path. So JetSet decides to try the shorter path that attempts to skip the USB initialization. It goes through a very similar process for the UART device, branching on the UART present variable. Again, it attempts to skip the initialization. Now it reaches the final branch, which branches on the all OK variable in RAM. Now, suppose the all-OK OK variable is only set if one or the other device has been initialized. JetSet would branch to the fail since the all-OK OK variable was not set in either init-USB or init-UART. And, if JetSet fails to boot the firmware, it has to backtrack and try again. So, it backtracks to the last known branch. This time, it will take the longer, unexplored path that initializes the UART device. When JetSet enters the function call, it will find a path from the entry of init UART to a return, then come back to the top level initialization procedure. After returning from this call, we again reach the end of the boot process. We check all OK, but this time we succeed. And all is well. We found a path to the firmware's boot point. So, I've demonstrated how JetSet searches for a path to the boot point in the firmware but how does it actually use this path to construct a peripheral model? To generate a synthetic hardware device from a successful path, JetSet uses an SMT solver to generate concrete device read return values that satisfy the constraints to reach the boot point. On a device read after the boot point, the device plays back the last satisfying value read from the address of the read. This allows the device to continue functioning after the boot point, although in a relatively simple way. The model JetSet creates can be used in an emulator like Kimu, which needs no further intervention by the symbolic execution engine. Let me show you how this would work on our previous example. So we return to our simple piece of firmware that initializes a USB and a UART device. An emulator for this firmware needs to respond to the reads to USB present and UART present, as well as any reads inside the init UART function. In the path to print boot message we found earlier, JetSet chose a path that skipped init USB, which imposes the constraint that USB present equals zero. JetSet therefore concretizes this read to a zero. The path that JetSet found did initialize the UART device, so the constraint imposed is that UART present does not equal zero, and JetSet initializes it to a non-zero value, namely one. Similarly, JetSet will initialize any reads that occur inside the init UART function. We can now use this set of device read constraints to create an emulator by replaying these traces. I've explained how JetSet searches for a path to the boot point in the firmware, and how it uses the constraints inferred during the search to construct a peripheral model, but how does it do on real firmware? To answer this question, we use JetSet to model the peripherals of 13 pieces of firmware. This firmware spanned three architectures, four operating systems, and multiple different application domains. For example, 
We analyzed consumer electronics, like the Raspberry Pi 2, a feeder protection relay used in the power grid, the SEL751, and a CMU900, a communications management unit used in the Boeing 737. On average, it took about 14 minutes to create peripheral models for each of these devices. The SEL751 took over two hours to construct a model for since it performed complicated arithmetic that tends to make SMT solvers quite unhappy. JetSet successfully generated peripheral models for all these devices, but this still doesn't answer the question of whether these models correctly model the underlying hardware, and more importantly, whether they help us find bugs in otherwise unemulatable firmware. We use JetSet's generated models to fuzz test the CMU900 and the Raspberry Pi 2, which are the two systems shown below. In the process of fuzzing the CMU900, we found a privilege escalation bug. This bug is not remotely exploitable, and we've taken the proper steps to notify Boeing and Rockwell Collins of the problem. We would not have been able to fuzz the CMU900 without JetSet, since no emulators for its hardware devices are publicly available. Besides the CMU900, we also fuzzed the system call interface of the Raspberry Pi. While we didn't find any new exploits, we found that in over a million distinct system calls, we saw the exact same behavior on the Raspberry Pi hardware as on our emulated device. This shows that the device model generated by JetSet did not fail during the fuzzing process, uh, even if we weren't able to find any new exploits. In summary, JetSet uses directed symbolic execution to generate emulators for firmware. We tested JetSet against several architectures and operating systems, and it helped us find bugs in otherwise untestable firmware. You can find the open source implementation at the link below. I will now be taking questions.